Hello and welcome. This VPAL signature event is brought to you by Harvard's Office of the Vice Provost for Advances in Learning. In today's talk, Professor Ko will discuss the pressing issue of homelessness as a health equity challenge, examining its impacts and what academia's responsibilities are, particularly within public health programs. Without further ado, Professor Ko, the virtual floor is yours. Cassie, thank you so much and welcome everybody. It's a great pleasure to be part of this Harvard VPAL series on homelessness and our efforts here at Harvard University and our Harvard Chan initiative on health and homelessness to address this increasingly visible and increasingly unacceptable humanitarian crisis. Uh, before I begin, I want to thank the Harvard VPAL office for inviting me and to you, Cassie McGrath and your colleagues for sponsoring this event. I want to thank my great deputy, Kirk Vanda, who has been a tremendous thought leader on this whole effort and is also helping me with the slide presentation today. Uh, but most importantly, I want to thank all of you for tuning in and thinking about this issue as a public health crisis and contributing to the conversation we're increasingly having at this university to address it in a systematic fashion. So we've entitled this presentation, It's Time for Academia to Establish Academic Homes for our homelessness. And we have at our university one of the few initiatives at a public health school or a medical school across this co country to address homelessness, especially from a health perspective. So let's review the challenges of the crisis right now and what we're doing here at this university to try to contribute to making a difference. So as a physician and a public health professor, I often start my talks with this opening slide about the basic statements about what is health and what are we trying to do in public health. The second statement is from the WHO Constitution from 70 years ago, which reads, quote, the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being. And if you come to our school, the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, you will see this statement in seven languages engraved into the concrete of the exterior of our building. And you will see some examples here. I must say that when I come to work, I often pause and look at this statement and think about the incredible mission of public health that we all share, the mission of trying to help each person reach their highest attainable standard of health. And also health is defined broadly by the World Health Organization, as you see in the first line, because health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So these two lines inspire me every day in my professional life and are good ways to start off a conversation like this. But when you think of a group of people in our country who, who fall far short of attaining their highest attainable standard of health, it's people experiencing homelessness day in and day out, and increasingly uh, over the last 40 or 50 years. If you just look at headlines across the country, from the bottom left to the upper right, and in between, you will see headlines from coast to coast. And it's fair to say that homelessness is increasingly visible. It's a humanitarian crisis. It's undermining the very fabric of our society, and it's roiling communities from coast to coast. So, for example, on the lower left, you see L.A. Mayor, Mayor Karen Bass, who, when she assumed office last year, her very first act was to declare homelessness in L.A. a public health emergency. And she has put tremendous time and energy to addressing that crisis with her team. On the upper right, you see an example from New York City, where Mayor Adams last year made news by his decisions to involuntarily remove mentally ill people from the streets for reasons including addressing the homelessness crisis in New York City. On the bottom right, you see an example of how homelessness is affecting certain vulnerable populations like the elderly. There are projections that the elderly homeless crisis will double or even triple in upcoming years. And then here in Boston, we faced our own set of challenges. On the upper left, you see Mayor Wu responding to the crisis at Mass and Cass, where there was an encampment of people experiencing homelessness for quite a while at the intersection of two these two major streets in downtown Boston. For right now, that encampment has been closed down and people have been 
resettled, but we have to see how long that will last and the need still continues. And then the center, you see the most recent example of how complicated this all can be with the ongoing issue of migrants coming into our state and around the country, and some of them looking for places to sleep wherever they can before they can get a foothold in this country and, and make contributions into to, uh, society. So as we tackle this issue and look at headlines like this, we should all ask ourselves, what are we doing as a society to address this in a systemic fashion? And how can each of us make more of a contribution? I will tell you how I came to be so involved in this issue, and that stemmed from my service as the former Commissioner of Public Health in Massachusetts several decades ago. Uh, one very harsh winter back then, there was a wave of 13 highly publicized deaths on the streets of Boston. The, the press covered each death very carefully. The advocates were appropriately enraged that people were suffering and freezing to death on the street. And there was no system for addressing this crisis back then. And so they literally stormed state government to ask uh, who is in charge for responding to this crisis and what was that person doing? <laughs> the answer I will never forget was no one and nothing. There was really no coordinated response system. And as we try to track where people died in the streets of Boston, they were dying in plain sight uh, on popular streets of Boston, near major medical centers, near major hospitals and universities. And these were people who were well known to local homelessness response organizations. Now at this time, it's really appropriate for me to mention my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Jim O'Connell. Jim and I have known each other for decades and I have just admired his lifetime of service to people experiencing homelessness and trying to build more humane systems for caring for them on the street. Uh, you'll see above this picture of Jim on the lower right, uh, first a copy of a book that he wrote six or seven years ago called Stories from the Shadows, describing his time caring for people on the street. I had the incredible honor of writing the foreword to that book. And then on the uh, next to that book is a more recent book written by Tracy Kidder, the award-winning author, uh, and Tracy wrote about Jim's extraordinary life. And this was a book that came out last year, Rough Sleepers. It's getting national attention. So back to the winter of 1998, 1999, uh, I decided as then the Commissioner of Public Health in Massachusetts to convene a task force to investigate these deaths, implement some kind of integrated response. Uh, Jim helped open up each meeting by describing the person or persons who had died and frozen to death. Uh, he and his colleagues cared for all of them. They knew all of them. And I would like to think that by convening these meetings and chairing them for a couple of years, uh, we prevented some deaths going forward and had more coordination and integration. But I'm not sure I can prove that. And But what I can say is that this issue has haunted me ever since. And um, I've been the state health commissioner. I later served as assistant secretary for health in the Obama administration. I've seen public health rise to the challenge and address the major crises of our day, whether it's HIV or cancer or COVID or more, re more recently climate change. But we have yet to see that urgent national response, integrated response to homelessness that this crisis deserves. So why is a public health approach needed well, public health is inherently broad. It's inherently dis interdisciplinary. This is a very complex issue and we need everybody involved. Uh, our field has a focus on social justice and health equity. We want every person to reach their highest attainable standard of health. We're into treatment, but also prevention, uh, promoting health at every stage of life. And it involves engaging lots of different stakeholders and coalitions to create a system for change. 
Over on the right, you see that right now in our country, we have groups and organizations and courageous individuals trying their best to address this, whether you are in the health world or the housing world or the education world or the business world. Public health agencies here and there are trying, but we really need to connect everybody in a broad, coordinated, integrated system if we're going to have any chance of resolving and solving this crisis. And a public health approach, we are proud to say, is uh, multi-pronged and starts by a focus on the individual, caring for people experiencing homelessness on the street and hopefully preventing homelessness in the future. We need attention to the interpersonal aspects because people who are experiencing homelessness are often completely cut off from friends and family and anybody else. They live what has been called relational poverty. And I'll be saying more about that in a second. We need to engage all institutions, not just health and housing institutions, but business and faith-based organizations and schools. We need all the community groups to step up and do more because this crisis is so visible right in front of us and it's getting worse. We need collaboration at the state and federal level. And we need to join with colleagues around the world uh, in an international approach to this crisis because it is preventable and there is so much suffering that we need to care for and prevent in the future. So if you look at the latest reports that just came out, uh, you will see, according to these point in time estimates, that since reporting started in 2007, you know, we've made some progress for a while, but the most recent numbers are going up. That's the upper line in blue. Uh, the middle line uh, are people who have shelters, and then the bottom line is people who are unsheltered who are living on the streets. So this is a tough slide to start with for a number of reasons. First of all, having any kind of estimates at all started only in 2007. Secondly, this is just what we call a point in time snapshot. It's like watching a movie and taking a picture of one scene. That's what we're seeing here. So at any one point in time on a given night in January, actually, people go out and count to see who are on the streets and in shelters. And that's how these numbers are generated. But it's just a snapshot in time. And we need more comprehensive data. And then if we're looking at the trends, why are things going up in the wrong direction lately? Well, there were lots of protections from government uh, through COVID, and those protections are starting to lapse. There was an eviction moratorium, and that has lapsed. And uh, so people are still very vulnerable. And so it is a reason that we need to be even more motivated than before to try to address this problem. And we can start with better data. So in our country of over 330 million people, we have this point in time count that estimates some 650,000 people who are experiencing homeless at any given point. But if you drill down some more, there are estimates that maybe one and a half million, maybe more are experiencing homelessness in any given year. As I mentioned already, about 60% are sheltered, about 40% unsheltered. About a third are chronically homeless, that is, um, are homeless for a year or more. And then if you look down at key characteristics, you can see that homelessness affects so many populations in our society. 60% uh, or so are male. It disproportionately affects Black Americans, 37% versus 14% uh, of the population nationally. So the issues of discrimination and race come in as major factors here. Uh, we can talk about family homelessness, where kids are involved. That's some 29% of the problem. Uh, again, communities of color are disproportionately affected with Hispanic or uh, Latinx communities disproportionately represented. Uh, we have already mentioned that issues of elder homelessness are rising 28% currently over the age of 54. Uh, next week, we are having, uh, as part of our seminar series in homelessness, uh, attention to LGBTQ populations who are disproportionately uh, represented as well for many, many reasons. Now, veterans have gotten a lot of attention in the, the country lately with respect to their homelessness rates. And 
here is some potential hopeful news that I'll be saying more about later. But uh, veterans right now are not disproportionately represented, mostly because there's been so much attention from the White House and Congress on veterans and trying to build better systems for them. And if we study what the VA has done, we can learn a lot of lessons, I hope, to apply for the rest of the country. So why focus on health and homelessness? Uh, we have some obvious reasons. Homelessness magnifies poor health. If you're out in the street, you can imagine the exposure you get to communicable diseases. It complicates management of chronic illnesses. Uh, people who are experiencing homelessness are literally trying to eke out an existence on the fault lines in society. And they are struggling every day for a safe shelter and a warm meal. And sometimes those priorities overshadow the health needs that, that the rest of us respond to uh, sooner rather than later. Or on the right, we see a picture of the street team, of Dr. O'Connell and Jill Roncarati reaching out to this person on the street. But street outreach, I'll be saying more about that, is a very vital part of caring for people experiencing homelessness uh, who are so, so vulnerable. To say more about health and homelessness, it's fair to say that homelessness makes you sick and sickness can make you homeless. There are high rates of comorbid conditions. Reviews and meta-analyses have shown uh, in general, some three quarters of people have some kind of mental health or substance use disorder. You can see the specifics uh, underneath that. Uh, a much lower number have severe mental illness, so more on that later. Uh, we also know that homelessness is dealt uh, is deadly. Unsheltered mortality rates are some 10 times higher than the general population. This is very important research that my colleague Jill Roncarati has done while a student at this school, the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. She is now on our faculty. And overall, on the right, uh, we know housing is important. It's necessary, but it's certainly not sufficient because we need not just affordable housing, but attention to many other dimensions that are driving this crisis uh, for our society right now. So homelessness makes people sick. This was actually termed by my colleague, Dr. Michael Hull, who graduated from our school in, of public health and is now caring for people experiencing homelessness in Texas and the summary conditions that leave people vulnerable over on the left. So not surprisingly, if you're a physician or a healthcare provider on the street, you see people with HIV and AIDS, lung diseases, liver diseases, wounds and skin infections, and then the mental health and substance use disorders that I've already mentioned. So the housing affordability crisis is one that's getting so much attention lately. And what we're very proud of at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health is we are steadily now reaching out to other parts of Harvard University and building tremendous collaborations. So one organization at Harvard University is the Graduate School of Design and their Joint Center for Housing Studies. Uh, I want to particularly call attention to my wonderful colleague, Dr. Jen Malinsky, pictured here on the lower right. And through her and her colleagues at the Joint Center, Chris Herbert and David Luberoff and others, uh, we have come to learn what the housing experts have studied for quite a while, that homelessness rates in a community begin to quickly increase once median rental costs exceed 30% of median income. Very important work by Glenn, Byrne, and Colhane. And then there's a term called cost burden renter households. So if you are spending more than 30% or even more than 50% of your income on housing, you can imagine what the burden is on you as a renter trying to hold on to the housing you have. Those numbers are going up and the number of cost burden renters hit an all time high in 2021, as you can see in a graph here. Now to simplify the challenges of why people are, ex are experiencing homelessness and the background of the lack of adequate affordable housing. The analogy has been made by Greg Colburn of University of Washington and other colleagues of mine in the housing world that this is like a game of musical chairs. So imagine that each chair is an affordable housing unit. And these are all people who obviously want to find a chair. They want to find housing that is safe and supportive and affordable. But if you have shortage, one chair gets taken away, that person lands on the street. And then if the shortage gets worse, which is which it has been over many days, 
another person loses any hope for housing, and then yet another one. And just, just to extend this analogy, if you can imagine that the people competing for the chairs are characterized by some people being elderly or vulnerable kids or having a physical illness or having a mental health or a substance use disorder or having inability to navigate the system in any way, they are the disadvantaged ones in the competition. They're the ones more likely to lose in this game of musical chairs and be out on the street. And I want to thank Kirk, uh, my wonderful deputy who created this slide for me, to just capture uh, what the competition results in in this society where the number of chairs are simply not enough. And so to drill down even more on this, there have been very important studies coming out of places like Princeton, the eviction lab uh, led by Matthew Desmond. And this led to a report uh, recently over on the left that young children make up the largest group facing eviction, kids under five, as you can see on the left. And it's especially black children who are disproportionately at risk, if, as you can see on the graph on the right. So when you have families with often single mothers and vulnerable kids facing eviction, that contributes to and complicates this crisis. And then we have to think even more broadly about risk factors in addition to the housing challenges and the health challenges. And there has been research showing multiple other dimensions contributing to this. Let's start with the top right for people who have endured ever since they were kids, so-called adverse childhood experiences. There's a very important and fascinating public health literature showing that if you're a child and you are going through adverse childhood experiences, like experiencing violence in your household, seeing uh, families break up in your household, uh, becoming a foster child, not having the educational opportunities that other kids have, and you have a so-called high ACE score, your risks of being homeless when you become an adult rise. We've already talked about the challenges of poverty, the issues of violence we hear all the time. On the upper left, the social factors of discrimination and equities I've already mentioned. And then on the bottom left, the more you look into this, there are all kinds of systems failures. So for example, if you are aging out of foster care in this state or any state, what sort of guarantees do you have that you're going to have a place to live when you get out? Same thing applies to people leaving psychiatric hospitals or people who are leaving incarceration or even people being discharged from emergency department from a hospital. Uh, I've seen situations where vulnerable patients are seen in the emergency department and then they tell the person, OK, you're free to go. And if the reply is, well, I don't have a place to live, the doctor may say, well, I've cleared you medically, but for you to find a place to live is somebody else's challenge, not mine, because my job is to take care of the physical aspects of your health. So these are ways that all these risk factors overlap to create this complex constellation. And then uh, the more you read in the literature and hear people's stories, uh, there are triggering factors. So vulnerable people may suffer job loss. They may be unable to pay rent. They get evicted, especially post-COVID. Uh, there may be issues of domestic violence that pushes them out of a house. There may be a family uh, disagreement, a divorce, separation, the disintegration of a marriage. Uh, a person may have a catastrophic medical diagnosis, um, altered mobility and accessibility needs due to aging, I've mentioned already. So sometimes it's the triggering factor affecting people who are vulnerable that pushes them out on the street and creates the homelessness crisis that we're seeing across the country. So what do we do to address this? Uh, we need robust, integrated systems to address homelessness. And we need academia to step up and play our part. And after years of thinking about this as a former health commissioner, as a former assistant secretary for health in the Obama administration, after learning from Dr. O'Connell and many other colleagues, we often reflected that here at Harvard University, we didn't have very many visible integrated academic programs to, to address this crisis. So we need, we need more academic homes, <laughs> to, to uh, put it simply. 
And so we wrote about this in the journal Public Health Reports and uh, put out a call to action a couple of years ago. And we said that if more universities, particularly public health schools and medical schools, address this head on, identified risk factors for homelessness, explored links between homelessness and health and contributed to the literature, support courageous teams on the street like Dr. O'Connell and Boston Healthcare for the Homeless Program, uh, reconnect marginalized people to housing, support federal efforts. I'll be saying more about that in a second. Appreciating signs of hope. And by the way, humanizing the discussion, and I'll be saying more about that. Uh, hopefully we in academia can make a contribution to making a difference uh, in this very important public health crisis that's affecting us coast to coast. So for the rest of the for the talk, let me just say a little bit more about each of these themes. Providing care for people experiencing homelessness Boston Healthcare for Homeless program that Dr. O'Connell now heads is the leading such program in the country. We are very proud to partner uh, with them. Uh, they are an organization that now has some 700 FTEs, which has been astonishing for me to witness as I've watched this organization grow and gain national attention. Uh, their mission is to treat patients where they are, including through street outreach. Uh, they have stunning uh, mobile health capacity, by the way. Uh, they establish a lot electronic health records for patients they're seeing on the street in the 1990s. This is well before electro electronic medical records took hold the way they are now. So they've been pioneers in many ways. Uh, they employ care protocols that are so-called trauma-informed. These clinicians and providers go out knowing that people on the street didn't choose to be there. Oftentimes, they've endured tremendous trauma and tremendous adverse childhood experiences. And so they need uh, outreach to establish trust and rebuild relationships, simply starting with humane acts like offering blankets and socks and food can go a long way. Uh, there are principles of trauma-informed care to follow. And here on the lower right, I'm very proud to say that uh, a physician who has taught me a lot about this is my daughter, Dr. Catherine Coe, who is an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School and is a street psychiatrist for the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless Program. So Boston Healthcare for the Homeless Program has these broad healthcare provider teams that go out onto the street, visit people in their homes, connect with other stakeholders who are addressing housing, food, transportation, legal services and employment needs. They're using high quality integrated data systems. Uh, this is a model that we can keep talking about to be employed around the country, uh, literally in every city around the country. And we're trying to track who, who is doing such work, which teams have street psychiatrists, for example, uh, which teams have links to academia and hospitals like Mass General Hospital and Boston Medical Center which ones have admitting privileges to hospitals, uh, just trying to create a seamless integrated system. Uh, we, we are trying to support that uh, in our initiative at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Now, of course, we are trying as public health professionals to work with our housing colleagues to reconnect marginalized people to housing. Uh, there is a continuum from homelessness all the way to the left to affordable home ownership all the way to the right with many stops in between, temporary housing, shelters, rental housing. Uh, you never see, rarely see, never see a straight line here. Uh, people experiencing homelessness have so many vulnerabilities and risk factors. So they need support services, they need ongoing subsidies, uh, they need monitoring and help. Uh, tracking people who are Experiencing homelessness by name is getting more attention because we, we need to know the inflow onto the street, the outflow, and try to work uh, in a syst systematic fashion to address this head on. And there have been a lot of efforts from the Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, to try to work on federal housing assistance and increasingly working with health professionals. The picture here shows uh, an interview I was honored to do in our Harvard Chance School of Public Health studio. We have a TV studio in our school, and we're very proud of that. And this is Deputy HUD Secretary Adrian Todman, who, uh, who came to Boston, sat in our studio, uh, spoke to our students, and talked about 
the ways HUD affects the lives of so many Americans working particularly on issues of housing stability and homelessness services in defined uh, geographic areas. Uh, they are paying attention to cost burdened households, which I've already mentioned. Uh, they are trying to address the issues of lack of affordable housing. Uh, there are many attempts through HUD over the years in public housing on so-called Section 8 and housing choice vouchers. So these are all efforts by HUD. And then uh, there has been very important research that so-called housing first is a very important step to reconnecting vulnerable people to some kind of a housing. Uh, the top bullet has to do with a very important randomized trial in five Canadian states studies the so-called at-home chez soi randomized trial. You can imagine how hard it is to do randomized trials in homeless populations, uh, but these tremendous colleagues in Canada did this work. Housing first means that you offer vulnerable people without housing uh, a place to stay with, without preconditions, without proving sobriety or being um, abstinent or other conditions. You, you give them the housing first, you, you try to support people in housing, and then you, you try to uh, keep the support going so people can have some hope of regaining a connection to society. Uh, the evaluations through this randomized trial showed a significant positive impact on housing stability. There's always the question of how much does it impact health outcomes, and that's still a debate. In fact, let me mention it now. In 2018 in the U.S., the National Academy of Medicine uh, did a report on housing first, but just as importantly, the concept of permanent support of housing. It's important to people put people in permanent housing, but you need the support services, the connections with caseworkers and mental health and substance use clinicians, and of course, uh, primary care providers. Uh, and at the time, the National Academy found that there was no substantial publish, published evidence as yet to demonstrate th that permanent supportive housing improves health outcomes or reduces health care costs. So this just shows the challenges of trying to lower the stress on the system and then on vulnerable people. Um, we want this research to continue. We particularly want more attention to the S in PSH. What is it that constitutes supportive services? Who should deliver them? Who should pay for them? How do we measure success? That's a very much an open question right now, but a way that health experts and housing experts can work better together going forward, particularly doing important research that's very much needed. So let's turn now to signs of hope. And I did mention that addressing veterans homelessness is a area that's getting so much attention uh, because as you can see from this slide that veterans homelessness has dropped more than half over the last decade, both uh, sheltered and unsheltered. Although again, the trends are ticking up a little bit in, in recent years. And you may ask, why is this? Well, I'm very proud to say that in 2009, uh, President Obama, who, uh, was uh, overseeing the administration that I served as assistant secretary, he and Congress pledged to reduce veteran homelessness as much as possible and even end it as soon as possible. So a little over a decade later, we're about halfway there, there, which is not enough, but certainly encouraging. And how did they do this? It was the leadership from the top. It was a uh, a partnership that involved resources from federal government and Congress. And the VA, to their great, great credit, have done tremendous work in trying to build better systems inside uh, all their health efforts to partner with HUD, to have their clinicians ask about housing stability um, when veterans come for their health visits, knowing that, that they are at risk. And uh, so we have, in our initiative, partnered with the VA as part of our efforts, and we're very proud of that, and more, more about that in just a second. So when you ask the question, how come very few academic sites have comprehensive initiatives for health and homelessness? Now, there are a number of really prominent individuals at places uh, like the University of Pennsylvania or 
or Vanderbilt or uh, UC San Francisco, which is a really outstanding place. But in general, there are very few health professional schools in the country that devote curricula to the clinical needs of people experiencing homelessness. Dr. O'Connell has often pointed out, and I often echo his comment, that NIH has 27 agencies. There is no National Institute for Homelessness. Uh, so they target research on diseases, not vulnerable populations. So there is an, not a natural stream of national funding. And without that funding, relatively few faculty go into the field. There's an insufficient mentor pool for researchers. There's a limited pipeline of young investigators. Uh, and I must say that in my years in academia, when students had come up to me in the past, they would express interest in this area, but then have nowhere to turn, uh, no mentors to guide them, not even a course to take. Uh, over on the right, I'm very grateful to my colleague, Dr. Maggie Sullivan, who along with Dr. Joel Roncarati have started the first course at our school and our university, I believe. So I'll say more about that in a second. So we're trying to tackle these barriers head on through our initiative. And academic partners, we believe, are critical because we can support on the ground homelessness response organizations like the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless program. We can provide much needed data and evidence. We can do important research. We can provide evidence-based best practices uh, to help other partner organizations around the country. And then very importantly, we can try to support national efforts. Over on the right is our dear colleague, Jeff Olivet, who is President Biden's top official addressing and integrating efforts to address homelessness nationwide. They've put forward some strategic plans and a research agenda to try to address this crisis. Uh, Mr. Olivet has become a dear colleague and friend of ours just in a few years, and we are uh, very grateful for his courage and his willingness to step forward and try to put national efforts together from where uh, his office is in Washington, D.C. So we started this initiative several years ago. Uh, we have a mission to develop and promote interdisciplinary public health solutions to end homelessness. It, this is a broad, very, very complex problem. Uh, we are very proud that we've built partnerships with organizations like Boston Healthcare for the Homeless Program, featuring leaders like Dr. Jim O'Connell and Dr. Katie Coe. Uh, we're very proud to have established collaborations with the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council, led by my colleague, Bobby Watts. I already mentioned Jeff Olivet and the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness. I've already mentioned the VA National Center on Homelessness among veterans. They're a close partner organization uh, now uh, led by Dr. Jack Tsai. Uh, over on the right, I just want to thank Drs. Maggie Sullivan and Jill Karate for starting the first course ever at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health on Health and Homelessness. And our hero in all this is Emily Lazobi, who is our program manager for the Initiative on Health and Homelessness. She has done an extraordinary job uh, as our staff member on this initiative, making all the trains run. We have monthly seminars now. We have uh, monthly newsletters. We have guest lectures. We have joint efforts with the Joint Center for Housing Studies and the Kennedy School Government Performance Lab, uh, also the Harvard Advanced Leadership Initiative. So all this has been built uh, because of our commitment to a public health approach. And we want to amplify what's going on the country, integrate efforts, support those who are providing direct service. Uh, we want to provide even the most basic education because of that, that didn't even exist until our initiative started several years ago. Of course, we want to advance research. And then we want to engage. Uh, we are a practice organization because uh, we want to make a difference on the street and create communities of practice, not only across Harvard, uh, not only across other academic institutions, but with uh, willing colleagues uh, from coast to co coast. And it's been so gratifying to meet the courageous people trying to address this. And we've uh, learned from them and partnered with them. And if I can say, we have more students now coming to the Harvard Chan School of Public Health because of our initiative, because they have found a home with us. And that is the most gratifying thing in the world. We want to support these young leaders I give them the grounding so they can go out and address uh, this crisis head on. So here are some accomplishments in our opening couple of years. I already talked about the first uh, course in the upper left. Uh, we've already had uh, over 100 students uh, taking this in the first few years. 
We produce new teaching materials and case studies. We are now promoting more experiential learning, uh, linking students with Boston Healthcare for the Homeless Program and other major organizations. Uh, we are promoting research here uh, in, in the center and fostering an academic research agenda. We're mentoring and providing faculty members with student with students and junior faculty. Uh, and then over on the right, the convening and engagement activities we're very, very proud of. Uh, we have a major event the day after tomorrow, actually, at, hosted by the Graduate School of Design and the Joint Center for Housing Studies, uh, featuring Dr. Margot Cushell from the University of California, San Francisco, who is a national leader in all this. Uh, we have a major two-day summit uh, co-sponsored by the Advanced Leadership Initiative at Harvard coming up in April. And then very importantly, that last bullet, we are engaging actually an increasing number of mayors, former mayors and other leaders from Boston, LA, Portland, Seattle, Chicago, New York City, and other places. So uh, every city, every major community is addressing this wrestling with this crisis, and we want to support and help them and learn from them and make a difference in building a better system. Now, here's one example of something I'm very proud of. I mentioned that the veterans homelessness situation has gotten better because of major programs launched by the VA. So one of their major programs is something called Supportive Services for Veterans and Their Families, SSVF. It's been around for over a decade. It's interacted with and so supported almost three, quarter of a, three quarters of a million veterans and their families served. Uh, but there had not been a comprehensive description in the published literature and analysis of, of what SSVF was and factors about why it has appeared to have made an impact. Uh, this is a program that if you drill down is very flexible. It's responsive uh, for changes like a COVID crisis that hit in the middle of all this, of course. It coordinates with groups uh, like HUD, and so it joins health and homelessness um, experts. And uh, the goals are not just rapid rehousing for those people on the street, but also prevention for those who are at risk who have housing insecurity. Uh, they are very creative in offering even shallow subsidies that pay for rent in a pinch, or but also utilities, uh, other costs that a vulnerable family may face uh, a vulnerable veteran family. And so it's focusing both on individual vulnerabilities that have to do with family structure and job loss, for example, but also addressing structural factors. So what we're very proud to report is that a team of us led by Renee Wilkinson on the left, she was the first author, wrote this up. And a team of us from Harvard and the VA were co-authors. Our dear colleague, Dr. Jack Tsai, who is the national leader on VA homelessness research on the right, was the senior author. This just got accepted for publication in the American Journal of Public Health and should be coming out in a couple of months. So when it does, we will have contributed to the literature about a key, key VA program that we hope can offer lessons learned for the rest of the country in terms of integrating systems and putting in resources to make a difference for people who are at risk for homelessness or experiencing homelessness on the street. So uh, we also want to, as part of our initiative, train a new public health workforce to address homelessness. You can imagine this is tough work. Workforce shortages are, are difficult. Uh, it is really critical when we do this to consult with people with lived experiences. Part of the joys I've had as the chair of all this is meet more and more people with lived experiences. There is nothing more inspiring and uh, thrilling than to meet people with lived experiences who have been on the edge and then come all the way back and then want to join in efforts to prevent suffering for their fellow uh, men and women. So there's a saying, nothing about us without us. Consulting with and learning from people with lived experiences is very, very important. And then I've talked about the importance of research, addressing stigma, racism, and social determinants, supporting and evaluating things like housing first and permanent supportive housing uh, models and evaluating uh, and improving the healthcare and behavioral health systems that uh, we have uh, to bear. Other signs of hope is that over on the left is a picture of the Boston Convention Center through COVID. And you may remember that in the height of the crisis, half of the beds, uh, first of all, an emergency hospital was set up in the Boston 
convention center. And then half of the beds were dedicated for people experiencing homelessness. And that was an extraordinary effort by then um, Boston Healthcare for the Homeless and partner organizations, then uh, Boston Mayor Marty Walsh, then Massachusetts Governor Charlie Baker. Um, and this just shows that if you have collaboration at many levels, at the organizational level, at the city, at the state level, you, you can make a difference. We have partnered with a major national group called Built for Zero Community Solutions, picture of Roseanne Haggerty, who's a courageous leader of that. Uh, she's trying to coordinate and galvanize efforts coast to coast like we are. We are learning from places like Houston, where under two successive uh, mayors, they have had success moving people from the streets into homes of their own. Again, this is because of leadership and coordination and commitment. Now, as I end, here is a very, very important theme that we at our initiative are trying to embrace. And a lot of the problems here is that people who are so vulnerable and trying to eke out an existence on the street have been dehumanized in the public discourse. Uh, so can we make an effort to communicate more effectively about the crisis, tell stories about individuals and make their stories come to life? If you have had struggles of your own or have family members or loved ones who have had struggles, can you talk about that and humanize the conversation? Gives, this gives people hope that uh, this is a solvable problem that we all need to step forward and address as human beings. And as part of this effort to humanize the conversation, we have been very honored to recently connect with this tremendous author, Kevin Adler. Uh, and he just came out with a book just in the last couple of months called When We Walk By. Uh, if you have the opportunity to read this book, uh, he writes these tremendous uh, observations that everyone is someone, somebody, uh, that homelessness is an issue of forgotten humanity and broken systems. He talks about the issues of relation, what he calls relational poverty, the incredible social isolation that people are feeling when they're on the street. Uh, they're often treated as invisible, as them, not us. So Mr. Adler has starred, not only written this book, and he got involved in the whole issue because his favorite uncle was a person who suffered from homelessness and um, struggled with this for a decade before passing away a number of years ago. Uh, he has now started efforts to, when he and his colleagues see people on the street, he will try to connect people with their loved ones by literally offering them a smartphone and saying, is there somebody you would like to connect with and start the process of reintegrating people into society? He has even written in there, how would Jesus use a smartphone? That's what's motivated him. And in one study, he actually got 24 courageous homeless people on the street to serve as autobiographers by agreeing to wear a GoPro camera, which would track the reactions of people walking by. One of the observations that, that Mr. Adler and his team found was every child who walked by wanted to stop and help people, but it was often the parents that would tug, tug at the kid's hand and say, oh, you got to keep walking by. So the, the kids learn from their parents. If we actually stop and address the vulnerable people that are looking to us for support uh, and join in conversations like Mr. Adler uh, is promoting, that would be a real advance for all of us in my view. And just to humanize this a little more, uh, I love music. I'm a vocalist, if I can say. <laughs> and there was this wonderful song that probably many of you know, Fast Car, that was made public in 1988 by Tracy Chapman. Uh, then a couple of years ago, Luke Combs uh, produced a cover of that song. And um, so both singers have made a name for this song, of Fast Car, and got a lot of attention in the re recent Grammy Awards. So I was watching those awards recently with my wife, and as the two of them were singing this famous song, I, one line of the song popped out at me over, the, on the, over on the left. I know things will get better. You'll find work and I'll get promoted. We'll move out of the shelter, buy a bigger house, and live in the suburbs. That was her dream. That was his dream. And I stopped and I said, wait a minute, did she say move out of the shelter? So I, I look, looked her up, and indeed, Tracy Chapman has experienced homelessness in her past. She's actually a person who uh, went to Tufts and got a college degree here in Massachusetts and used to play in the MBTA stops I've been reading. So she has 
humanize this through her music. And I think this is just one example of how we can keep the conversation going and involve more people from the arts and all sectors of society to make a difference. So as I end, uh, I want to share some spiritual thoughts on this. I, I'm a person who's very committed to the spiritual dimensions of public health. And uh, I've been always moved by this quote from Reverend Martin Luther King. I choose to dedicate my life for those who have been left out of the sunlight of opportunity. I love that quote. So many people that we are witnessing experiencing homelessness have le been left out of the sunlight of opportunity, and it's up to us to make a difference. Uh, last month, the Harvard Gazette ran a little story on our initiative, and in the last line of that story, I had this quote, we want every student who walks through Harvard Square, Harvard Yard and sees vulnerable people lying in Harvard Square to not accept their suffering as normal. Sadly, at our university, when we walk into Harvard Square, this site is somehow normal, and uh, that is should not be acceptable, acceptable to any of us at this university. Uh, Harvard Magazine is going to have a story on our initiative next month, so we're looking forward to that. And so, uh, as I conclude, we feel that this longstanding homelessness crisis needs urgent, unified action from all sectors of society. And I close by quoting my dear mentor, the late Reverend William Sloan Coffin, the former chaplain of Yale. He said that we should care most for those whom society counted least and put last. That's what we're trying to do with our initiative. Uh, we're hoping that with efforts like these, the uh, support of the vice provost and the university, and for all of you, we can educate students, motivate researchers, and pre pre prepare the next generation of health professionals who can be leaders to address this crisis head on. So thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you, Dr. Ko. We will head into some questions. The top question at the moment is, Given that more than 75% of homeless are mentally ill, how many of them need institutional services, i.e. not a home, but a medical or residential institution? Okay, very important question. And so the mental health and substance use disorder dimensions of this are major. Uh, and that question is being raised in a time where we all understand that the mental health services system in our country is far from optimal anyway. So the courageous people who are trying to address this issue from that point of view are trying to create better systems, not only street outreach, but also better attention to these issues from everybody on a multidisciplinary team uh, to attention to these issues in transitional housing and then in permanent, permanent supportive housing. And we, we need a stronger continuum that goes from uh, care on the street all the way into shelters and then clinics and then hospitals and hopefully uh, stronger systems all the way through. So again, I mentioned uh, my daughter, Dr. Catherine Coe, Katie Coe, she, she is addressing this. I'm very proud to say that the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and, and Mass, Ge Mass General Hospital are, are taking increasing interest in this. And I'm hoping that there's gonna be a more attention to this very important dimension of the homelessness crisis uh, going forward. What is the feasibility of providing clean and regulated campsites for homeless people, much like a KOA, to allow them to shower and have safety? There are lots of attention to addressing those basic needs. Uh, I have a colleague in San Francisco who actually volunteers every week to offer simple shower services to, to people on the street. You, you can imagine such basic needs that we all take for granted are, are a huge gift for, for people who have no place to call home. So paying attention to those very, very basic needs, paying attention to clothing, socks, food, those are all part of healthcare and public health, as, as I mentioned earlier. I'll never forget last year, the New York Times did a very nice series of stories, series of stories of people who regained housing after homelessness, experiencing homelessness for a long period of time. And the question was, what did you appreciate most when you regained uh, stable housing? And one person wrote, I'll never forget this. I never dreamed I could take my own private shower and have my own little personal bar of soap. That was a real luxury for me. So those are things that we all take for granted and we shouldn't because uh, 
addressing those very simple basic needs can be one way to offer support and also, by the way, reconnect with people on the street who uh, have often lost trust in anybody around them and are so socially isolated. This is a clarifying question. Why isn't the PIT count done more than once per year? Oh, well, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, probably resources. This is sponsored by Housing and Urban Development, HUD. Um, you know, I think the broader issue is why aren't there better data systems so we don't have just a snapshot on one day? We, I mean, we, we need a much better set of data to track who's coming in, who's coming out, who's experiencing homelessness in a year or over many years. So I think I think what the person who posed the question is asking is, why don't we have better data systems? We, we need much stronger data systems to accurately track trends overall and by segment of population. Uh, that would be a major first step to having better research and, and um, evidence that we can use to build better systems. And this will be the last question. Apologies if you have already answered this, but what are some programs that we as a community can take part to tackle the health crisis? Are there any low stake initiatives? Well, I think uh, anybody who is interested in this should take a little um, inventory of groups in their community or in our state that's trying to make a difference and, and try to partner with them. Uh, as I mentioned, we have here in Boston and Harvard and Massachusetts partners that we're very, very proud to work with. But in, in our work in the initiative, we, you know, we have colleagues in, in Lawrence and Western Mass. Um, we have discussions now ongoing with other schools of medicine and public health to bring more attention, have more courses, those sorts of things. Uh, we have partnered with an elder homelessness organization, Hearth. Uh, we're meeting with them soon. Uh, th there is an office of youth homelessness at, at the state level that I was unaware of until we started this initiative here. I served as a state health commissioner for five and a half years. So I think partners are out there, but we just haven't built the partnerships so that we're working better together. And that's what we're trying to do in the initiative. So I think everybody can take a little inventory, start with your own town and jurisdiction, and then just keep reaching out. And if we can support you in any way, uh, we'd be happy to do that. Thank you, Dr. Ko, and thank you, Kirk, for running the slides. And thank you to all of us for joining us tonight. We hope you'll join us for more signature events soon, including one tomorrow night on federal climate rules with Professor Jody Freeman and the Salata Institute. Information about upcoming events, as well as recordings of past ones, can be found at vpal.harvard.edu slash vpal-events. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening.